So let's now talk about pros and cons of shipping your own vehicle over to Europe. Okay, so when we were considering whether or not to ship or come here to buy, the main issue that we imagined was that when we fly across to Europe and we land, if we were to buy a vehicle, that means we will have to go to a place where we can find a used market to be able to find a vehicle to buy. And for us being five people, it's really difficult anywhere, basically, Europe or US, to find a camper that's ready to go with five, five people seating and five people sleeping quarters. So the last thing we wanted to do is to be stuck at an Airbnb or a rental apartment while we research and find a place and then not knowing exactly where to buy lumber, parts, hardware store and stuff like that in order for us to build out a van custom. So being able to build out our van in, in the US and ship it over here so by the time it got to the uh, receiving port, we were able to jump in and start traveling right away. That was a big plus for us. The shipping cost for our van one way was about when you add up all the costs, which include the port fees, the shipping fees, and the taxes, and the temporary permit, and stuff like that. By the way, that's all handled by our shipping company. Uh, it turned out to be about $2,500. And, and from what we heard is essentially based on the dimension. The cost is based on the dimension of your vehicle. And it has relatively little to do with which port you ship out of. The cost seems to be the same, whether you ship on the West Coast or the East Coast, or even the Gulf Coast. The main difference from where you're shipping from comes down to how fast it actually gets to the receiving port. The entire process of shipping, it's about a two week journey from port to port, but you have to bring your vehicle to the departure port a week ahead of time. So we had a couple days of delay in between, so it ended up being roughly about three weeks from when we brought our van to the port of Baltimore and then being able to pick it up at the uh, receiving port of Zeebrugge, Belgium. And besides having it ready to go, we didn't have to stop and buy any personal items because our van was, it was filled to the gills <laughs> with all our stuff. Even though when you ship, you're not supposed to have any personal items and you sign off for that, but I think that's to do with liability and you suing them for stolen items. So we had it, we had all our plates, all our clothes, extra, you know, medicine, kitty litter. It was food and we had everything in it. When we were planning to get the, sh the van shipped from the U.S. to here, we read, it's actually, it's clearly written in the document, it says that you're not allowed to have any personal items in it. But from all the people that we talked to, nobody actually checks. So what we did, which was important for you guys to think about too, is you can have your personal items inside, but don't have anything visible that you're not willing to lose. So what we did is that we made sure everything was packed away in cabinets, underneath the bed. We have a big storage compartment underneath our bottom bunk, and you can access it through the front or the back of the van. And we actually cut out pieces of plywood that fit that exact size hole and screwed it in shut so it's not accessible. So in that case, we could, brought, we could bring it in even if they were to check, which they ended up not checking at all, whether or not we had personal items or not. They wouldn't be able to see anything. Essentially what they don't want is they don't want people to have just a bunch of stuff inside a van. They don't want your van to become a cargo container. They don't want you to just, just bring, you know, a whole bunch of like electronics to sell in Europe. Yeah. It's not a way to import products. Also be aware that if you do have anything visible, for some reason it does get stolen during the journey, they're not liable because you're not supposed to have anything in there in the first place. And I think that is why, like Marlene said, why they have the stipulation that you're not supposed to have personal items. And I think the biggest pro of shipping your own car, which we didn't know once we found this out, we were so happy we shipped over, is in Europe, you have annual inspections. And you have to go mm -hmm. back to where your car is registered and go through the inspection process. We didn't want that to limit our travels, having yeah. to be back somewhere. Some states in the US have that too, because I want to say, I think mm -hmm. we have some friends that, that have their car registered in like Virginia or Maryland, yeah. and they had to take their vehicle back to that state for inspections as well. 
So imagine having to do that. Let's say you buy, you come to Europe and you buy your car in France or Germany, and you decide to travel into, you know, Turkey or Greece or Bulgaria. But every year you'd be forced to drive all the way back to Germany and get the vehicle inspected before you can continue traveling. Europe is relatively small, so maybe it's not as big a deal as it might actually be, but it's just the hassle to have to do that. So because our car is registered in California, we don't have to get it annually inspected. We do have to get our registration uh, from California mailed to us because the car has to be valid for driving in the country that it's from for it to be legal here. Because it's a new car, it doesn't need, we didn't have to get a smog check for our first registration renewal, but this coming up year, we did have to do that. But the California DMV has a form that you can fill out that will exempt you from the, the upcoming smog check if you're physically in an area that is not available to be smogged. So that's what we're having to do this year. We've had to do that before because I believe once our previous vehicle had to be smogged and we were on the east coast and couldn't make it back. I don't remember it being much of a hassle. Basically just mail it in with an extra form filled out with the uh, renewal fee and you get the sticker in the mail. Foreign license plate. So this can be a pro and a con. <laughs> yeah. the, you know, it depends on how you want to look at it. When we thought we were bringing our Sprinter over to, to Europe, we thought, okay, great. This is, a, this is a popular European car. Everybody have these. But it turns out most people have either Ford Transits or uh, in the US would be a Ram Promaster van. Here it's, uh, it's the Fiat Ducato is the original manufacturer of these vans. They've been adapted into Renaults, Peugeots, and a couple of other companies have taken this body and stuffed their own engine in it just the same way that Ram did with their Promaster line. So our Sprinter is actually relatively uncommon and especially it's a four wheel drive so it's kind of uncommon as well and, and in the color, mm -hmm. the stone gray color is one that we've never seen here. People have had their their sprinters, more commonly color sprinters like white or yellow. black or yellow like wrapped with a different color. Mm -hmm. But for this to be a factory color it's pretty rare here. And, and ladder, worst of all, yeah, yeah and our um, ladder. Illuminous ladder, yeah. worst of all, what gives us away the most is actually our license plate. And we didn't really think about this, but I guess we do this in the US too. When you see a car driving by, you see, oh, Florida or Arizona, especially when you're in a state where a car is from out of the state, it's the first thing you notice. People notice that here too. It's a little bit harder, so people actually are way more obvious when they look down to see where, where, the, uh, where the car is from, because in the European Union, all the license plates look the same, except for a couple of letters in the bottom left corner. But for us, they can see us coming from a mile away because our license plate says California and looks nothing like the European ones. Yeah, they have like a skinny rectangle. We have a fat rectangle. Yeah, we got a tall, narrow one. Yeah. So that could be, like Marlene said, it's a pro or a con, depending on what you're into. We want to be a little bit more inconspicuous, but at the same time, anytime somebody sees our license plate, it's a good icebreaker. They start talking to us. Mm -hmm. And you know, we've met a few people just by traveling traveling this way and have people come up and say, hey, you guys are from California, you know, that's a long ways. So yeah, and that's that's actually kind of a nice way to you know to to meet some other travelers. Mm -hmm. And the last pro that we've noticed, I think from our trip to Norway this summer was I don't think uh, some countries know what to do with automatic tools with our license yeah. plate. We spent the summer in Norway and they have an automatic toll system based on your license plate where they send you the tolls in the mail and we haven't received any in California. Yeah. So we, we might have gotten away with not paying tolls in Norway. We'll see. We'll see. It's been about... <laughs> that could be a pro. It's been, it's been about four or five months and we haven't gotten anything in the mail and that's where these automatic tolls are supposed to come. We have these in the U.S. too. Some. I think there's a few Southern California highways that are automatic tolls that just take a picture of your license plate and send it to you. Like in Florida, the you know the uh, the highways down to the Florida Keys, I think is that way. Norway was supposed to be a very expensive toll road system, and it's all automated, but we haven't gotten any tolls. And I'm guessing because it's so rare that an American car is here driving around, maybe they just don't even bother. 
they just throw ours out the door if they can't recognize it. Or we're going to get a big bill. Soon. Or, <laughs> yeah, or whenever we'll we see. go back to Norway, we're disallowed. <laughs> big alarm bell sounds and starts going They're on. They're back. Okay, so those are pros. So now for our cons. So cons for shipping. Cons for shipping. Number one, yeah. I think is cost, right? Yeah, cost is obviously one that most people, you know, notice right away. It's how much does it cost to ship a car like this over here? Um, but I actually don't think about it as a huge con once you factor in both the pros and the cons about shipping a car over here. But it is kind of expensive. Depending on how big your car is, it'll ours, one like ours will cost $2,500 to ship each way. So that means you're, you're going to be for sure out $5,000 just in shipping alone. But if you really think about it, the fact that you don't have to drive it back to the country to get it inspected, which will cost money and tolls, wear and tear and fuel every year. That could save you some money there. And also the fact that you don't have to rent an Airbnb or rent a garage to build out your van when you get there. Possibly, you know, you might spend even more than just the shipping costs in renting an apartment for a couple of months while doing the build. That could save you money there. And then thirdly, I think when you're ready to leave, the fact that you have a deadline to sell your vehicle before you go could be a major problem as well in this in a place where you can lose money because if you want to sell your car quickly you're gonna to have to sell it for less than you bought it for so the differential between buying it and selling it that could be greater than five thousand dollars right there okay the next con we wrote down here is draws attention which yeah could go either way again yeah Again, it could go either way. So like I said, it draws attention because we have a California license plate and people see it from a mile away. We talk to them, but at the same time, I feel like there have been a couple of situations, one notable in Montenegro, we had a, we had a police wave us down just to check our paperwork because I think because we look kind of out of place. We we're also the only car there, so I don't know, maybe, maybe he would have waved us down anyways. Yeah. And then in second place we had that happen to was in Bulgaria. Mm -hmm. They wanted they waved this down to wanted to check our um, you have to buy a vignette, which is like a toll pass uh, that's good for a certain period of time. And if you don't have it, they can find you. So maybe they saw us California license plate. Maybe they assume that we may not know what we're doing there. So they stopped us to check our vignette, but fortunately we had it. So yeah, so that could draw kind of unwanted attention if that's not. But I you think know, at the same time, some people like waved us through because they didn't want to deal with us. It's true because <laughs> some of these countries, you know, not all the countries speak great English. And even if like in Montenegro, for example, they speak essentially the same language as Croatians. So Marlene can speak with them. But the fact when they see a California plate and if they're not confident in their English, they may just let you go because they don't want to deal with it. Yeah. Annual renewal, which we talked about. Yeah. So that's a con. For the last year, we had friends visiting us. Our car's registration renews on the on April of every year. So we had friends visit uh, visit Europe in Paris, and we flew out to Paris to meet them. And they actually brought us our registration renewal, which was great. It was totally convenient. Uh, but what happened is that we were going to Turkey at the time, and at the border of Turkey, we had a registration that was still valid until April, until April 2nd. But we were going in there in March and because the way we write down our months, our month, day and year is four to year, in Turkey they do the, the day first and the month in the middle like most of Europe. They looked at it as our, register, our registration having already expired. Yeah, there's a little confusion. Yeah, so there was some confusion there that, that took about an hour worth of back and forth. To resolve but if you don't have somebody that can mail you your registration paperwork then that could be problematic um, important con um, a lot of people don't know about is your foreign plated vehicle can only be in the EU for six months at a time this is one thing that's sort of ambiguous in the way that the law is written as well because it's not a common practice for people to do it the, the way that the law is written is that when you get your car off of the boat, you have six months basically to temporarily import it. And I think the purpose of that is to give you some time to register it in the country where it's going. Mm -hmm. But because we're not keeping it here, we're eventually going to ship it back to where we're from. 
there's no real good mechanism for us to renew that six month registration. So we actually emailed the European Union at the Europa.eu website several times. And finally, we got an answer from them that basically says, after 180 days in the European Union, the vehicle has to leave. And the act of leaving and returning means that you've legally exported and then re-imported your vehicle for another six months. So we have no way of proving that because when you come back in from a non-European Union country, you don't get another paperwork saying that you have six more months. So the only way to prove that for us is to basically the burden is on you. You have to have as much information as you can gather while you're out. And the fact that we have third party liability green card insurance only valid for EU countries means that every time we leave, we have to buy third party insurance at the non-EU country. So we keep that paperwork as one form of our proof that we've left. And the other ways that we do it, we don't, we haven't actually had to prove it to anybody yet. So I don't know how well this will work, but just for our peace of mind, we keep the insurance paperwork. We also make sure we get gas at a foreign, at a non-EU country fuel station, mm -hmm. and we keep the receipt, and we take pictures of our vehicle at those gas stations. Mm -hmm. So that's basically the temporary import rule. So that's a little bit more confusing than probably what most people that have traveled with their vehicle to foreign countries are used to. In Mexico, it's a very standardized process. You actually get legal paperwork stating when you entered, how long you're supposed to be here, and when you leave and come back, you get new paperwork. But you don't get new paperwork here. If you travel south, like down to Pan Am, you're going to a new country and everything's separated versus in Europe. Yeah, it's all separated, but also this union meshes everybody together and common yeah. rules, so. It's great it, for short-term travel, Yeah. but for long-term travel, it can be complicated. So now let's talk about buying one here in Europe. Yeah, so if you decide that you don't want to bother with shipping your own vehicle, which actually is, you know, is something that we've now consider is more viable because now we know uh, what the big home improvement stores are and, you know, what kind of lumber we can purchase and what types of iron or aluminum angle stock we can buy to build these interiors out and what types of propane and camping gear and what stores they are. So now we can actually probably do it knowing what we know but coming in from a completely new angle buying um, buying a ready-built van might be the way to go but it wasn't for us because there there still aren't any ready-built campers that can fit five people that we would want to travel in that's small enough I still think it would take us way longer with the language barrier with taking taxis or public transportation yeah it would cost more for sure and right? you got to deal shipping. with how long you're legally allowed to be in that country and you have to exit and your van's not ready. Right, you, It's like, right. there's so much going on. You'll be under a, a, a time crunch for sure. Yeah. So, but if you were to decide to buy, and let's just talk building it aside. Let's say you were able to buy one right away. Just to buy a vehicle here, first of all, you have to have a local person from the local country where you're buying the vehicle from to be able to register that vehicle under their name for you. So that's the tricky part. For us, we can actually do it because Marlene has um, Croatian citizenship and has an address there. We can register it in Croatia and have all the paperwork be sent there. It will be totally legal. However, um, self-built camper vans are not legal there. So or in most countries. In most countries, in Spain, for example, it's not legal either. I think mostly like, the UK is legal and maybe some other Northern Europe, European countries are legal, but I think maybe in the Netherlands is legal. For the most part, it's gonna be tricky to figure out where you buy the vehicle from and whether or not it's legal to do a home build. And I think there's companies and RV shops that'll help you through this process. I know in France, yeah. we had friends do that. So there are right. options like that, you're just paying for it. Yeah, exactly. That'll come down to, to the cost thing as well. So if you don't have European residency, you have to figure out if you can find somebody you know to either register for you or use one of these companies. I can put one of the company names that our friends using down in the description below for you guys to check it out. And for the most part, they're a little bit probably more expensive um, 
then somebody on a budget will be willing to pay. But if that's not an issue, then that's definitely an angle that, that, that you can go with. Let's say, hypothetically, you have somebody that you can register the vehicle with. Now, the tricky part with that is that if you were ever to leave the Schengen zone and you have to go through a border crossing, it could be tricky because now your vehicle registration does not match your name on your travel documents. Some countries it might be okay to do that, assuming they're in the European Union, but just not Schengen, and that's why they have a border crossing. But going to a country like Montenegro, Bosnia, Serbia, Albania, and Turkey for sure, you're gonna wanna have matching documents with the vehicle registration and your travel documents. People will pay for what's called, called a carnet, which is essentially like, it's like a, a deposit that you put down to prove that this vehicle is yours and if anything happens, they would just keep that large, large deposit. Some countries require you to have that in Africa and like South America, but <laughs> carne is not required anymore in Europe. Sorry to laugh, there's some guy doing donuts like right next to us and all this dust. Not that close though. Like, like we're <laughs> safe from it, but he's doing donuts. So buying your, uh, buying a vehicle in Europe, you're, it's going to be a little bit of a time waste for exploring the buying process. And we were especially scared of the selling process and mm -hmm. that whole thing and how long that would take. What if nobody wants to buy for months? Yeah. You're in an Airbnb and you're just, I don't know. A couple people we know, somebody who came and bought a travel trailer and a tow vehicle ended up having trouble selling their vehicle because the brand of travel trailer they got had a bad reputation of being, you know, an undesirable type of vehicle that they didn't know because, you know, when you're not in the market, when you're not familiar with the market, you don't really know what to buy. So what seemed like a great deal when you buy it, you'll find out why it was such a low price when you try to sell it. And then we had another friend who's currently trying to sell their vehicle right now. Maybe they've already sold it, but they had people back out multiple times when they were trying to sell their vehicle. That's all while being up against the deadline to leave the country. So that could be really tricky. And that's why I said earlier that you could lose a lot of money in that process when you're trying to sell. And like we said earlier also about annual inspections. Like depending on yeah. the country, it's annual or biannual, right? Right, some countries so. will let you go two years without inspection, but uh, most countries it's every single year. So. A lot of this basically comes down to how long you're gonna be here. If you're only gonna be here for six months or maybe a year, no more than that, then it just doesn't make sense to spend two months at the beginning building out a vehicle, finding and building out a vehicle, and then two months at the end trying to sell it. So that takes away a third of your travel time if you're only here for one year. Okay, so now let's talk about pros and cons for buying a European RV. The number one pro obviously to buy versus shipping is that you're not paying for the shipping process, assuming you have a way to be able to buy and register it. Uh, a second pro is that you're gonna blend in more with the places that you go. Most travelers that we've seen are from Germany, from the Netherlands, and from the UK, and obviously there's other countries as well. Just camper van travel culture is not as popular in most of the Eastern European countries. And you know, that probably has to do with the fact that Western Europe has more money and has therefore has more disposable income to be able to do stuff like this. I guess that could be a con because you could get somebody, we see a lot of Germans that travel and then when they get out of their camper van, they go talk to other people that have German license plates. So if you got a German license plate, you don't speak German, you know, <laughs> maybe that's a pro because then you get to learn. <laughs> Border crossing should be easier for you with a yeah. European plated car because they want to be, we. Because they're familiar with the paperwork yeah. that you're bringing, right? Yeah. So you should see the looks. Every time we give them a California registration, they're like, uh, uh. Right. Sometimes they, don't they know look it going. up on Google to make sure it's a real one. Right. But this is all assuming that your registration paperwork for the car matches your travel document. Okay. And uh, another pro is the systems are made for these countries. Your yeah. Black water or black tank is made to be dumped here, no problem. Same you're as You're not having to water. adapt anything. You know. Right. So, and all your parts are here, service centers. Yep, exactly. Uh, and charging, you're set up to charge here, no problem. Yeah, again, 220 or 240 volt AC to charge versus 110. 
So you really want to be careful. Some electronic devices are compatible with both with just a simple adapter, but charging and uh, electric motors, anything that have an, have an electric motor in it is not going to be compatible with the high voltage power, AC power that they have here. So those are the pros that we reiterated from all the stuff that we mentioned earlier. So let's talk quickly again about the cons. Annual inspection, that's a big con. Uh, the language barrier, if you don't speak the language, trying to buy a place or try to buy a vehicle can be challenging. This is a situation where you could potentially lose a lot of money if you buy at the wrong price and you're in a hurry to sell at the end. But on the other hand, you could actually make maybe make money if you buy a nice, good condition, rust-free work van and you convert it to a nice camper, you could potentially sell it for more money. But that just it's all about the amount of work you're willing to put in and the amount of risk that you're willing to take on. And some of the cons, if you're building and outfitting, like we wanted to put solar on your top of your European bought camper, it's gonna be a little bit of pain. There's right. not, a lot of countries don't have Amazon or they're selling the right, they don't have the options that we have in the US. Yeah, I think our experience specifically is in Croatia. If we were to buy something in Croatia, it would be difficult for us just because there's no, Croatian Amazon and the shipping process to get product from Amazon can be really challenging and also it's not legal to have self-built vans so that's also depending on what country you're able to do this at. So that's it that's kind of a long-winded <laughs> pros and cons about shipping your vehicle versus buying your vehicle. Yeah after a year and a half we have more experience now to talk about it than we did in the beginning. So I hope that was helpful to you guys and if you guys stuck around for this long, we really appreciate it. Give us a thumbs up if you haven't already. If you want to see more videos like this, click down below to subscribe. Thank you guys right. for watching. We'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.